Welcome back to Nomad Nomad, Echoes of Adventure, the channel where we take deep dives into some of the most important motorcycle journeys from this century and the last. I'm still your hapless host, Jeff Thomas, and after introducing you to Nomad Nomad with the cunningly titled Introduction, in Episode 1 we dash through a brief history of motorcycle adventure, and then in Episode 2 we literally race through the long but speedy life of Erwin Cannonball Baker. In Episode 3, Delving into the trials and tribulations of a sill, a young two-wheeled Turkish adventurer with an aversion to compulsory military service, although that took us on something of a tangent, here in episode 4 we'll be taking a conventional look into a very real, but certainly unconventional character. The man under the microscope is Robert Fulton Jr, or more correctly, Robert Edison Fulton Jr, and as after circumnavigating the world on a Douglas motorcycle in the 1930s, he'd go on to invent and produce the world's first flying motor car, I guess the middle name Edison was really quite appropriate. Yep, you heard me right, the flying motor car. But such inventions seem to run hand in hand with the Fulton family name, because a hundred years earlier it was another Robert Fulton who designed and built the world's first practical submarine, the Nautilus, and the world's first practical steamboat, the Clermont. Good morning, Dyslexa. Do we know if the early inventor Robert Fulton was directly related to the later inventor and adventurer Robert Edison Fulton Jr? And good morning to you, hapless Jeff. Given the family name, geographical proximity, and eccentricity of their inventions, many assume that the two Robert Fultons in question were related. However, although the New York Times did describe the latter Robert Fulton as a collateral descendant of the earlier, my own research has revealed no direct family connection. Well, thank you, Dyslexa. And although that sounds like Robert Fulton the Elder had a bit of a, an away record, whatever the New York Times really meant by collateral descendant, I'll leave to your interpretation. Well, we'll come back to Robert Fulton Jr.'s inventions later, and the best place to start with Robert Fulton Jr.'s life of adventure and invention is probably the beginning. So, on the 15th of April, 1909, in Manhattan, New York, Robert Edison Fulton Jr. was born. And if I say that his father was the president of Mack Trucks and that his mother's family owned Stagecoach, the company we know today as the Greyhound Bus Line, we can probably assume that they weren't a family who circulated poorly. As a teenager, Fulton had travelled with his family extensively and in doing so, developed a fascination for aircraft. And after attending finishing school in Switzerland, he'd go on to Harvard to study architecture. After graduating from Harvard in 1931, he'd elected to spend a postgraduate year studying architecture at the University of Vienna. And it's when that year approached its end that our real interest in Robert Edison Fulton Jr. begins. At a dinner party in Vienna, in response to a guest asking what he'd planned to do next with his life, without thinking, Fulton had announced his intention to travel around the world studying architecture. His comment had caught the attention of a fellow guest, a gentleman by the name of Kenton Redgrave, who'd recently purchased the Douglas Motorcycle Company. And after suggesting that Fulton might like to use one of their motorcycles for his journey, the ball of adventure had begun rolling. In a scene to be repeated 70 years later in Long Way Round, after furnishing Fulton with their latest six-horsepower twin-cylinder model motorbike, Douglas engineers had set about preparing it for the unknown journey ahead. They'd added an additional four gallons of fuel capacity to allow him to cross deserts, a windshield to protect him from the elements, and swapped the motorcycle tyres for more readily available rubber from a car. They'd created storage space for the sensitive 35mm film he'd be using along the way and when all free space on the motorcycle had been used, they'd added a sidecar for additional camera equipment. They'd even made a secret compartment in the skid plate to hold his Smith & Wesson revolver, and in May of 1932, they'd declared the motorcycle, which by then had been more like a gentleman's club on wheels, and Fulton, to both be ready to go. At the age of 23, Robert Edison Fulton Jr. had set out to circumnavigate the world on that motorcycle. And at the time, everyone involved in the project had assumed that he'd be the first person to do it. 
Back in those halcyon days of yore, long-distance motorcycle adventures were rare, and Carl Stern's Clancy's journey of two decades earlier had obviously already been forgotten. But after setting out from London, it hadn't taken Fulton long to learn the first lesson that most long-distance riders are still learning today. From London, Fulton had crossed the English Channel and ridden into mainland Europe, but just 400 miles into his journey, realised that he'd been carting far too much unnecessary shit along with him. In Paris, he'd given away the small library of books he'd been carrying, and in Italy, the folding bed, sleeping bag, and most of his pots and pans. In the Balkans, he'd ditched his dinner jacket and tuxedo. And after meeting an Australian who'd been in the final stages of walking around the world facing backwards, had unhitched his sidecar and abandoned that too. It's what I like to call total lost touring, where you make somebody happy by giving them the shit that you no longer need, and make your own journey easier, and therefore more satisfying, by lightening the load. It's a win-win situation. But even though Fulton seems to have kept his Smith & Weston, he thankfully seems not to have used it. Well, at least not in anger. But he would go on to get shot up the Khyber Pass. And no, that's not a euphemism. But thankfully, the bullet seems to have missed. By the time he'd reached Greece, like many adventurers who'd follow in his tyre tracks, Fulton realised that the journey had already changed. His camera was no longer pointing at interesting architecture, but at people. People who, with each mile further away from London and Paris, had become increasingly interesting, and in his eyes at the time, wonderfully eccentric. A motorcycle journey had morphed into a journey that just happened to be made by motorcycle, and the sandy expanses of eastern Turkey had prepared him well for the deserts of Syria and Iraq ahead of him. Like many of us, Fulton never did master the art of riding on loose sand, and by the time he'd reached India, he turned the act of skipping unharmed from a tumbling motorbike into a well-practiced art. His original target destination had been Japan, and by the time he'd arrived there, he'd learned two other things that future travellers would go on to repeat. The people with the least to give had always offered him the most, and the places and people that those at home feared the most generally turned out to be the most inviting and hospitable people on the planet. Overcoming all of the challenges aboard his twin-cylinder Douglas, Robert Fulton Jr. did reach Japan, and then, after continuing onwards to cross the United States, would record his journey in the book One Man Caravan. He'd also go on to do a speaking tour of America, where he'd recall his around-the-world adventure, assisted by miles of 35mm film he'd shot along the way, footage that he'd later transform into the movie Twice Upon a Caravan. Now, with regards to Fulton's journey, there seems to be some confusion and debate about how many miles he'd actually travelled, and whether or not he'd actually circumnavigated the Earth. Well, technically, as he'd ended up back at his starting point, he did circumnavigate the Earth on his Douglas. But the confusion as to whether he'd ridden 25,000 miles or 40,000 miles to do so, well, I'll let you judge that for yourselves. In 1932, the English Douglas Motorcycle Company called my bluff gave me a motorcycle. They even outfitted it with special fuel tanks and a steel skid plate and a special rack to carry a 35 millimeter motion picture camera to record the year and a half that I spent going around the world 40,000 miles through 20 countries on three continents. In 1937, I even wrote a book about it called One Man Caravan, when it's the title of this film, Twice Upon a Caravan. The confusion seems to stem from how many miles Fulton rode and how many feet of film he shot, but as the 40,000 miles ridden comes directly from the horse's mouth, I'll assume that there'd been 25,000 feet of 35mm film stock. Now, before we move on to the small matter of Fulton's flying car, let me tell you why, in my humble opinion, Guinness World Records totally suck. You see, when riding a four-cylinder Henderson, Carl Stern's Clancy had girdled the globe in 1912 and 1913, he'd been 23 years of age. And when two decades later, Robert Fulton Jr. did the same thing on his two-cylinder Douglas, he'd also been 23. However, with no disrespect to either of them, it's Kane Avellano who the Guinness Book of World Records declare the youngest human to ever circumnavigate on a motorcycle, a challenge that Kane achieved in 2016. What Kane Avellano did was and always will be an amazing achievement, 
and a 23-year-old me used to struggle to find his way home from the pub. Dyslexia. Who is the youngest person to have circumnavigated the world on a motorcycle? Hapless Jeff. When setting out on their respective around-the-world journeys, Clancy, Fulton, and Kay Navalano were all aged 23. However, when Clancy and Fulton completed their journeys, they were both aged 24. However, Kay Navalano completed his journey when still aged 23, making him the youngest person known to have circumnavigated the Earth by motorcycle. Well, thank you very much, Dyslexa. So it seems that Kane is our man. But colour me cynical, if we're comparing the year 2016 to the years 1912 and 1932, then Peter Hickman's Isle of Man TT lap record of 135 miles an hour shouldn't detract from what the likes of Dave Jeffries, Mike Halewood and Mick Grant achieved. One person's accomplishment shouldn't detract from another's. But even though the achievements of Clancy, Fulton and Avalano were all in their own ways amazing and unique, it was only Fulton who'd go on to invent, and then build and pilot, the world's first practical flying car. So, how do I raise the matter of flying cars without making Robert Fulton Jr. sound like Doc Brown from Back to the Fucking Future? I'm not entirely sure. But when his collateral ancestor, the earlier Robert Fulton, first came up with the idea of the Nautilus, I'm kind of betting that he got a few side eyes too. Well, beyond being an intrepid adventurer, our Robert Fulton was also an architect and an engineer who loved flying. And whereas my pet hate is running out of beer money before running out a month, his was apparently landing his private airplane on airstrips and then having to walk into town. Obviously, Having a car parked at each landing strip would be impractical, so of course, the answer was to design and build an aircraft that also operated as a car, and call it the Airphibian. Then why can't the airplane travel down the highway? Obviously, the wings and the tail are too big, and the propeller is dangerous. That's simple, just leave them behind. And so, magic presto, the Airphibious ideal and the four-wheeled amphibian. Now, I'm no expert, but it's probably better to be 10,000 feet in the air and cursing your plane for being a shitty motor car than a shitty aircraft. But as airplanes require a slightly higher degree of certification than automobiles, the financial costs of designing, developing, and then bringing the Airphibian to market almost bankrupted Fulton. After building the first Airphibian, in 1950 it was flown by the world's most famous aviator, Charles Lindbergh, who two decades earlier flying the Spirit of St. Louis, had been the first person to successfully fly across the Atlantic Ocean. After selling the rights to his flying car, the Fulton Airphibian FA3101, a total of eight would be produced, but despite the idea and design being genius, I probably don't have to tell you that that idea didn't really catch on. By the age of 24, Robert Fulton Jr. had graduated Harvard as an architect, ridden 40,000 miles around the world on a twin-cylinder Douglas motorcycle. He'd written a book, One Man Caravan, and made a movie, Twice Upon a Caravan and would go on to work for Pan American Airways as a cinematographer, travelling the world aboard their fleet of clippers and filming the fun for adverts. During World War II, after inventing the world's first ground-based flight simulator, a device to help US pilots survive in combat situations, he then transformed it into a training aid to help ground-based artillery units shoot down planes from above. As World War II ended, in the late 1940s, Fulton had gone on to design and build the world's first flying car, the Airphibian, an example of which now stands in the Smithsonian. And on 7th of May 2004, sadly, at the age of 95, Robert Edison Fulton Jr. had made his final journey. Now, Robert Fulton Jr. certainly lived a long, full and inventively adventurous life, but did I mention that his family were friends with Egyptologist Howard Carter and Fulton had been at the opening of Tutankhamun's tomb? 
Well, apparently he was, but for a chap who achieved so many things in his life, that little fact seems almost like garnish. And for a little bonus fact, after studying how British trains had used an outstretched hook to collect mail sacks from station platforms, Fulton had invented the Skyhook, a device that allows an aircraft to swoop a person up from the ground without landing, and something that's still used by militaries around the world today. He'd invented the Skyhook in 1950, but in 1930, the master of Pickering Railway Station in North Yorkshire had been struck and killed by a speeding train hooking mail sacks from his station platform. Several years earlier, that same unfortunate station master had proposed the London Elevated Monorail System, the transport system that would become the Docklands Light Railway. And he'd also invented the soft close safety doors that we now see on tube trains and elevators around the world. That man's name was William H. Fright, my maternal grandfather. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this journey through the life of Robert Edison Fulton Jr. And if there's another character or journey that you'd like to discover more about, then don't be shy. Leave a comment down below and we'll see what we can do. And once again, I've been your hapless host, Jeff Thomas, encouraging you to always ride safe, leaving more smiles and miles behind you. So until next time, Bye-bye now.